Good morning, Boone's Creek Christian Church. My name is Heath Chanelli, and I'm the Minister of Adult Christian Education. This is our Sunday School lesson for May the 3rd. We will study in depth Matthew 18, 15 through 17. So please turn in your Bibles, or turn on your phones, or open your laptop to Matthew 18, 15 through 17. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault, just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, Treat him as you would a pagan or tax collector. When I began to prepare today, I thought I would be able to simplify this message into an easy-to-follow flowchart, a quick how-to of reconciliation. Step one, one-on-one. -on -one. Step two, two or three on one. Step three, the church on one, and step four, excommunication. That seems pretty harsh to me. And that's the way the text sounded the first time I read it. And this raised a major question for me. How do we reconcile this pathway of dealing with conflict through a framework of grace? The Bible, which is full of prophecy, poetry, proverbs, history, story, primarily examines messy relationships. It does not lend itself to neat, clean 21st century flowcharts. It primarily examines messy relationships. First, our relationship to God. And second, our relationship to one another. Or as Jesus said, love God and love people. And these two major relationships are rarely neat. They are raw. They are challenging. They are messy. The scriptural story is not a how-to on how to oust someone from the church. Instead, it's about loving people, in particular, messy, 
reconciliation. So today we will examine the stages in the process of seeking restoration and reconciliation within our relationships. To preface, this cluster of passages and parables drip with grace. I'm not forcing grace into today's text of my own choosing. It's important to recognize that today's text is surrounded by two parables, and this is called an inclusio, with a parable of the lost sheep before it and the unmerciful servant after it. While our passage is pretty stern, think of this as a grace sandwich with two very grace-filled parables that form bookends to our text. Now let us begin with verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault, just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. Where are the grace notes in this restoration process? First, go to your brother and sister. And second, go in private. There's no shaming the individual. There's no ridiculing him. And probably most importantly, you're not to gossip and commiserate with others on how to deal with this situation because the Bible sets the precedent. Scripture is our guide. Now, according to James Byron Smith, gossip has two dimensions. The first dimension is speaking negatively. And it is the act of speaking negatively about someone who is not present. John Wesley wrote some rules of engagement for his small groups. And one of those rules was not to mention the fault of any behind his back and to stop short those who do. Wesley would have had none of the following. Oh, by the way, did you hear about? Yeah, he really messed up. Well, have you heard about? What I heard was, we really need to put her on the church-wide prayer list. Many times gossip is not as blatant as I just made it. It just kind of sneaks into the conversation and is often unintentional. But this does not make it any less harmless. You see, gossip seems to be a tolerable sin within the church. I want to challenge us, myself included, to protect the person who is not there to defend themselves. We want to protect the absent. You may ask, how do we protect the absent? Practically speaking, there are three ways you can avoid gossip. You can walk away, you can redirect, or you can reframe. When gossip begins, you can walk away. Choose first not to participate in the negativity towards another. This is a bold step, and it may be all you feel you can do at this time. However, it does fall short in that you step away, and when you step away, you no longer have the power to squelch the negativity. Second, you could choose even a bolder step. You can redirect the conversation to something else. This shows you are unwilling to participate but you also, you're able to extinguish, extinguish the negative conversation. It's like throwing water on a fire. Third, and the most daring, is to reframe the negative talk like Matt Johnson often does. Well, I don't know Tom as well as you, but he appears to be a really generous person. This goes a step further by changing the climate of the conversation, not only extinguishing the sin, 
but transforming it into something positive. Each of these choices is an exercise in Christian character. Walk away, or redirect, or refrain. I challenge you and myself to put these into practice today. Now for the moment, let us backtrack to emphasize the grace process found in Matthew 18, 15. Be proactive. Note that the one who has been wrong, the one who is wounded, is the one who takes the initiative. And I've got to admit, this is a difficult charge. They offended me, and you want me to go to them and hand out an olive branch? Well, Jesus teaches, do to others as you wish for them to do for you. For all you know, the person may not even know that they've offended you. But, before you approach the person, take time to examine your spirit. And whatever you do, before you go, please pray in private. I'm not talking primarily about praying for the issue. I'm talking about praying for the person, praying for their well-being, praying for restoration, and praying that there may be a blessing upon all who come together. In taking the focus off of self, something may shift inside of you, and your wounded heart may create space for grace. I want you to listen carefully to the words of Dr. James Byron Smith when he writes about prayer and reconciliation. Prayer is a wonderful gift from God that helps us in at least three ways. First and foremost, we are inviting God into the situation. We are not alone, but we are co-laboring with God in an effort to help others. Second, we begin to feel more compassion and less critical. Third, we have the wisdom of God available to us. God can provide guidance and perspective that we do not have on our own. As an aside, after you pray, and you may want to pray multiple times, go face to face. No texts, no emails, no posts. Just don't do it. These mediums can be easily misunderstood and have greater potential to escalate the conflict. We probably have all experienced this, been on the short end of technology. So I want you to take the high road and look the person in the eye. Eye to eye. And also, do not dwell on the hurt. Have you heard the term ruminating? This is what a cow does with a wad of hay. Chewing, chewing, swallowing, spitting it back up, chewing, chewing. This sounds pretty gross to me. And all that chewing doesn't make it taste any better. Similarly, dwelling on the offense does no one any good and only causes the pain to increase in the offended party. It damages you, it damages me. And as Anne Lamont has said, unforgiveness is like drinking rat poisoning, waiting for the rat to die. Back to our theme. The goal of grace is to reconcile with our brother or sister. And this can only be done if you have the right prayerful perspective. Jesus says in Matthew 7, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite! First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck 
from your brother's eye. What is the plank? It's your judgmental attitude. How can you come close to someone when you have this plank between you and the other person? Think of it as social distancing with a two-by-four. The best you can do is just lob some verbal hand grenades. So I began to think, what plank is in your eye? What plank is in my eye? No one sees clearly from a distance. You can only serve up close. So get rid of the plank, the distance between you and the other person due to your judgmental attitude. Come close enough that you can put your arm around the person. Now before we move on to the second stage in this process, we must remember that Jesus is talking about a very, very serious sin. You see, before we go on a witch hunt, we must remember that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The sin needs intervention. It's not a slight, it's not a minor offense, it's a capital offense. The person is disruptive within the church because of the offense, and the very essence of the church is at stake. The second grace note in the restoration process comes from Jesus quoting Deuteronomy 19.15. One witness is not enough to convict a man accused or any crime or offense he may have committed. A matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I would paraphrase this as bring a few good men, bring wise counsel, and don't bring people who only support your position or who do not like the person. Like not gossiping, this too is about protecting the other person and keeping their best interests in mind. As Dr. Eugene Boring writes, the sinner is guarded against arbitrariness and hasty action brought by a single individual. Bring a few wise people that the offending party respects so that the goal of a restored relationship is kept in perspective rather than being seen as punishment or humiliation. If the two previous attempts don't bring about resolution, take it to the church. The early church met in homes, and about 20 to 60 people would meet in the home depending on the size of the home. Now, why is that important? Because these gatherings of 20 to 60 Were their family, were their their allies, were their kin. And that is where this text is difficult to apply today. Many of us talk about the church as family. That is a good goal to aspire to. But is the church really family? Looking at the back of someone's head for an hour a week, 52 weeks a year, does not create family. Close relationships do. What we have to say is, does this person really feel like he or she is losing something vital? Is this group of invested individuals who I know, respect, and do life with worth losing? If this church that you surround yourself with does not hold this kind of value, then the effort is futile. That is why I encourage people to have healthy, accountable relationships, like those groomed in close proximity through small groups, through life coaching, through mentoring, through discipleship. People with the same mission of becoming more like Jesus. Real relationships where mutual accountability is cultivated. Healthy accountability is where God is asking you to engage with Him. 
A brother or sister can hold you accountable for what you desire to do with God as a co-laborer. For example, I want to spend extended time with God alone once a month. Now, this is not a to-do list to gain brownie points from God or to seem super spiritual. It's an opportunity to lower the noise in my head so that God can speak to me through His Word and in prayer. A friend will be calling me on May 7th to see what I did or didn't do. This type of accountability keeps me close to our first grace note. Having a brother in Christ that I can trust and be fully honest with and challenge me when I am not engaging with God in a healthy way. I've said that many messy, broken relationships is the crux of this passage. However, this text seems to run out of grace by verse 17. If he refuses to listen to them, that is the two or three witnesses, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. This verse implies a limit to forgiveness. However, as I said at the beginning, this passage is smothered in grace. Remember the grace sandwich that we spoke about at the beginning? First was the parable of the lost sheep. If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he is happier about the one sheep than about the ninety-nine that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should be lost. The good shepherd is on a seek and save mission. No matter how far you've gone off the tracks, no matter how far you've wandered from Jesus, He is pursuing you. He is seeking you. Someone or something may have given up on you, but Jesus never does. Our passage today is followed by the parable of the unmerciful servant. And I would encourage you to read it this week. It could easily have been part of today's lesson. However, I'm not going to comment on it because that is next week's lesson. So there's no spoiler alert. In closing, you may be struggling in one of your relationships. Life has gotten messy. Amid the added stressors of being quarantined, furloughed, cooped up, and locked down, you do not have to be destined for a future of a different kind of social distancing, separating yourself from those who have wronged you. Reconciliation and restoration of broken relationships is possible in Jesus. In His love letter to us, He has shown us how. Now, I'm going to say this is never easy, but most good things are worth the effort. If you would like to begin a process of restoration, whether it is in your relationship with God or your relationship with another person, and you feel like you need guidance on the journey, this church is here to help. I would be happy to work with you to build a plan towards wholeness. If this is something you are committed to, you can reach out to me personally at heathshinelli at boonscreekcc.org. Let us pray. God, we thank you so much that you have reconciled us. May that just overwhelm us to the point that we want to be reconciled with others. May you make this happen this week and the following weeks. In Jesus' name, amen.